Tonight's teaching is, Who is God? What are the attributes of the entity we refer to as God? Who is God to you, the listener? This is more of a personal question, and uh, so how would you describe God? Who is God to you? What is God? This is something that everybody needs to think about and to uh, to kind of dwell on for a little bit because everybody has a different idea of who God is and I could say that he is simply the creator of the universe but to you uh, God might be somebody or an entity that's completely different. But before we get started on the attributes of God, I wanted to show what God is not. And throughout this teaching, you will see that there will be a lot of biblical references used. Uh, there will not be any extra biblical references in this teaching. It comes only from the Bible, and uh, I think that you may be surprised on just how much is uh, shown, and I know I have not gotten everything, but uh, I have, uh, or at least I hope to give you a more rounded view on who God is. So what God is not is a liar, or nor is he regretful. God is not like any other God, or any other being for that matter. He is not the God of the dead, according to Matthew, Mark, and Luke. He is not a God of confusion. And you'll notice that I'm using the pronoun he, uh, right now just because that's how everybody tends to see God or at least the majority of the people uh, but we'll delve in later uh, is God male female or genderless God is not mocked nor is God unjust nor is he ashamed and God is not man he is an entity. Uh, but wait. Does God have a name? Does God actually call himself or herself or itself by something? Does God state to use a name when referring to him or it? The answer is obviously yes. This is God's name in Hebrew. Reading from right to left, you have the Hebrew letters yod Hey vav Hey, or in ancient Paleo, yud Hey wah Hey. And this is stated in Exodus in two different places, uh, both of which we're going to look at. Exodus 15.3, but the meaning of the name in Exodus 15.3 actually comes from Exodus 3, verses 14 and 15. This name is mentioned over 5,500 times in the Bible, with the first mention in Genesis 2.4. So if it's mentioned that many times, why are we not using it? Why do we simply use the title of God? So here's the verse in Exodus 15.3. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. In the Bible, whenever you see capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, that is uh, a way to kind of hide his name. And a lot of people will say that 
that was done out of respect uh, following the Jewish custom of not saying God's name in order to not uh, blaspheme or not take his name in vain. So here it is in a transliterated format. And when I uh, use the name, I will either say Yote Vave or Yahweh. Uh, many people have different ways to say this. Uh, some people will say Yahweh is not correct, uh, but that is the form that I'm going to be using in this teaching. So here it says Yahweh Ish Melhama Yahweh Shemo. And again, that is simply stating the same verse. And in Exodus 3.14, God says to Moses, I am who I am, and he, uh, Meaning God said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Well, the I am here is important. He's not saying Yahweh has sent me to you. He is saying I am. So here, again, is the transliterated format. Vayomer El Elohim Moshe Eya Asher Eya Vayomer Kotamar Livnai Israel Eya Shlanahi Elakem. And here I've highlighted the I am is Eya. And like I said earlier, this is the format or the source of. Uh, where the yod heh vav -He comes from. And, as I said, everybody says it slightly different. Yehovah, Jehovah, Yahweh, or Yahweh. These all mean the existing one. Uh, this is believed to have stemmed from the word haya, meaning to exist, or hava, which also means to exist or to have breath. So in the Hebrew thought, the breath is the character of someone or something. Just as a man has character, uh, so do objects. This is a quote from Jeff Benner from the Ancient Hebrew Research Center. So when you look at the meaning of yote vav -He, meaning to have breath or to exist or the existing one and then you go back to uh, exodus 3 14 15 where god says i am a lot of translations will say the one who is or uh the one who exists rather than I am. And that's where this uh, ancient understanding actually comes from. So Yahweh is where, what gender, and whose. And uh, yes, he belongs to somebody. And I'll get to that. What does Yahweh do? What does he do for us, to us? What does he do to our enemies? And what does Yahweh do in general? First, where does Yahweh live? He lives nearby. Well, he also lives in heaven, where most people think he lives. He also lives in Zion. And he is with you in all that you do. Again, he is nearby. He is with the generation of the righteous, according to Psalms fourteen fifteen or fourteen five, excuse me. He does not live in temples made by man. So what gender is Yahweh? And again, as I said earlier, I refer to him as you can tell in a male pronoun. Uh, but what is the Bible state? What are the sources of a male figure or a female figure? 
So here, uh, Yahweh is the father of the fatherless. He is my only one father who created me, according to Malachi, John, and Ephesians. He is the father of mercies, the father of glory, the father of all, the father of Jesus, otherwise known as Yeshua. He is the father of spirits and the father of lights. Well, there's not exactly a whole lot of references to a female father, is there? Uh, there is only a male father. You cannot have, uh, according to any uh, custom or any uh, even modern thinking, uh, you would not have a female father. So here, uh, we're going to continue this, where uh, Yahweh has steadfast love for those who love him and keep his commandments. Uh, that was written in Deuteronomy. His work is perfect. His foolishness is wiser than men. His word is not bound. His word is living and active. His weakness is stronger than men. His eyes are on the righteous. His ears are open to the prayers of the righteous. And his face is against those who do evil. And his testimony is greater than that of man. So, as you can tell, uh, everywhere in the Bible, it mentions Yahweh in a masculine form. Not a gender neutral, not a feminine, but a masculine. And I recently uh, watched a video uh, on the origins of a lot of what this person believed to be the origins of the Bible and different pieces of it. And it was very interesting how far this person was reaching to try to discount much of the Bible. And I'm, and I say that from somebody who's interested in all of ancient history in, from the Near East and just the sources and the, uh, just the uh, information this person presented was very limiting and they basically used one source and to show uh, that pretty much everything was pointing back to this one pagan god and uh, which is also interesting because that pagan god is called out within the bible and in a couple of places so uh, I just wanted to mention that that not every extra biblical source not every historical source is uh, good and Yes, I am only using the Bible in this teaching as a single source of truth, but I hope in the future to use many sources uh, to show uh, some of these same points. So let's move on. Who does God belong to? And whose God is Yahweh? Well, he's the God of Shem of Abraham and of Isaac. He is also called the fear of Isaac <clears throat> in Genesis 31. He is the God of Jacob. And he is the same God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's not just the God of those three. He's the God of all of Hebrews, as well as Nahor, Elijah, David, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or if you're a big uh, VeggieTales fan, Rakshak and Benny. Uh, he's the God of Daniel, of Jesus, of both Jew and Gentile, as well as all flesh and of the living. And again, 
uh, when we go back to what he, uh, what God is not, he is not the God of the dead. So here, and we already saw the reference to that, and here in Matthew we see that he is the God of the living. He is also the God of heaven, of Bethel, or Bethel, of Israel. He is the God over Israel. He is the God of Jerusalem, being a little more specific. The armies of Israel, spirits and the prophets, the spirits of all flesh, the clans of Israel, uh, also the tribes, as well as the entire earth, all of the earth, and the whole earth. So there are three references, uh, Genesis 24, Joshua 3, and Isaiah 54, all stating that he is the God of all of the earth. But what type of God is Yahweh? He is a God of seeing. He is a God of faithfulness. He is a God of knowledge. He is the God of salvation. Uh, according to Psalm 18, God of my salvation. Our salvation. My righteousness of glory. Of my life. Of vengeance. He is the God of my praise. The God of justice. Of truth. Of recompense. Of glory. He is the God of endurance and encouragement. He is the God of hope. He is the God of peace. He is the God of all comfort, of love, of all grace. He is also called El Shaddai, or God Almighty. He is God, according to Deuteronomy 7 9. Here, it says, Know therefore that the Lord your God, remember when Lord is all capitals, that's Yahweh, He is God. Well, there's something special about this verse, uh, and this is Deuteronomy 7 9, where this is what it is translated in English. But English has a tendency, when it's translated from the original languages, to leave bits and pieces out. And this is a very important example of this. So here is uh, the transliteration of the second half of that where it says Lord your God he is God and it's Yahweh Elohecha Hu Ha Elohim what's special about this is this little word right here or prefix Ha it translates to the word the so when you look at it, it says Yahweh your God is the God. Not just he is God, but he is the God. So when you reread that using the correct translation, it says, Know therefore that Yahweh your God is the God, meaning the one and only. No other place that I know of uh, that comes to mind right now uh, outside of the Bible will say that any God is the one and only God. Let's continue. He, Yahweh is greater than all gods. Well, notice the, uh, in the word gods, lower G. That uh, should signify uh, that it's not a name, it's not a proper title. It's a classification. So all carved gods, all idols, uh, anything that we make into a god, Yahweh is greater than all of those. Yahweh is also greater than man. He is a great and awesome god. Again, when you look at a literal translation of Elohai Ha Elohim, it means the God of the gods. He he over he's over 
he's like the uh, top guy here. Same thing from Adonai uh, Adonim. He's the Lord of the Lords. Yahweh Sefayot, the Lord of Hosts. That Lord of Hosts is mentioned over 200 times. Uh, same thing with Elohai Sefayot, meaning the God of Hosts. That's mentioned 42 times. God is a witness. So in Hebrew custom, uh, or actually, it stated that you would need at least two witnesses to prove a fact true. Well, in both the Old and New Testament, Genesis 31 and Romans uh, 1 9, here it states that God is one of those witnesses. So when you call upon God to be a witness, well, there you go. He is a consuming fire. He is the rock. And from the New Testament, we know that uh, somebody else is called the rock. And you're going to see a little bit of some parallels uh, going forward that where certain words are used to describe God, uh, describe Yahweh, that also describe the uh, one of the key players or the key people in the New Testament. He is an everlasting rock. He is the glory of Israel. He is a teacher unlike any other, according to Job. He is a righteous judge. He is the king of glory. He is my strong refuge. He is a fortress. And you notice a lot of these are uh, wartime and battle uh, references. And that's very important as well. He is a dwelling place. He is our strength. And he is the king of all of the earth. He is my helper. He is the upholder of my life. He is a sun and shield. He is our song. He is our savior and redeemer. There's one of those parallels. He is our husband. Another parallel. He is the salvation of Israel. He is the Holy One in Israel. He is the only Savior, according to Hosea 13.4. Now, that's uh, one of those parallels that I'm going to talk about in a future teaching where you have uh, God, or Yahweh, being the only Savior, but then you have Jesus or Yeshua also being the only savior so how can that be you'll have to wait till the new teaching he is the lord of kings he is a revealer of mysteries he is the king of israel and he is the lord of harvest and we're still going on what type of god is yahweh what are the characteristics he is the judge of all he is my helper. He is the only sovereign. So what does he do? Or what has he done? Or what will he do? For us, to us, to our enemies, and in general. He created the heavens and the earth according to the very first verse in the Bible, as well as Isaiah 45.18. He formed the earth to be inhabited, also according to Isaiah. Not only did he create it and then form it, he possesses it. Well, since he possesses it, he's allowed to give parts of it away, and therefore he gives land. He made everything. Well, we just got done 
seeing that he made heaven and earth. And within making all things, he forms you. And after he forms you, he gives you breath. Then he gives you a name. Then he calls you by that name. And then he doesn't just call you at any given time. He calls you in righteousness. Well, because he made you and because he formed you and gave you life, he knows your thoughts. And then he leads you in the way that you should go. Well, he doesn't just leave you alone, kick you out the door. He equips you and gives you the tools and the knowledge you need in the path that he's given to you. And if you falter, he's going to strengthen you. But that's not all. He's going to personally take you by the hand and keep you. And whenever you see the word keep, uh, not every time, but uh, in this type of reference, it means to guard. So he's going to take you by the hand, just like a father does, and he's going to guard you. But that's not all he does. He resurrects the dead. And he delivers people from death. He's able to raise up children from the stones. And he will fully resurrect you. Look at Lazarus. Look at Yeshua. They didn't just say, hey, I'm alive. No, they were brought completely back to life and when Yeshua was brought back to life he was uh, on earth for a certain period and then he was taken back to heaven <coughs> he will put his spirit in those that he raises up just like he did Yeshua He is a present help, not a delayed help in times of trouble. He does get angry. There's many times in the Bible where uh, it shows his anger. Uh, he got angry at the children of Israel at Sinai because they decided to worship him in their own fashion instead of... Uh, doing it the way he wanted and the way he instructed. But when he does get angry, he is slow to anger. He, he doesn't have a short fuse. He lets us uh, try to do the right thing. And he, uh, if he does get angry, then, or when he gets angry, he does like a father. He just continues on a, a disciplinary path. And so there's also times where it says that he relented, he calmed down. He rides through the heavens to help out. Well, <coughs> this is me. After he rides to the heavens to help you out, he's going to come fight for you. And not just in any way, shape, or form. He's going to come as a warrior. Or as Exodus 15.3 uh, states, as a man of war. He is going to then avenge. And he's going to protect us as a shield. He's also the protector of widows. He's going to protect us from the evil one, or Satan. And when he does punish, it's not something small. He's going to punish to the fourth generation. But he doesn't want anybody to perish. He wants us to repent and ask forgiveness. And so when 
we do, he's going to forgive us according to numbers, directly forgiving iniquity and transgression. He's going to take us to new places. He's also testing his children. He tests us to see if we love him with all of our heart and with all of our soul, and so that we might see ourselves as beasts. Now, that doesn't mean to look at ourselves and see us as a cow or a buffalo or anything like that. This is this verse is talking about uh, seeing ourselves as imperfect, as seeing ourselves as uh, children that need to be led, to be guided, and not just as something ugly or anything like that. It's more of a pictorial image uh, that this verse is speaking of. He also tests the heart and mind. And I didn't have, uh, I apologize, I did not have the reference for that one. And this is something most people don't realize. In 1 Samuel 16, there's evidence that he is the one that puts harmful people on, uh, har excuse me, harmful spirits on people. Uh, he, uh, that's a whole study in and of itself uh, regarding possession and evil spirits. Uh, and I'm not going to get into that here i'm just saying i wanted to point out that it's spirits don't automatically just possess a person sometimes they are put on people he also feels indignation on a daily basis he bears our burdens daily and like a mother bird or father bird he fills our mouths if they are open wide when we look to him, when we ask for guidance, when we ask for wisdom, he's going to give us that wisdom. But again, it's going to be done in his time, not in the time we want. Hey, God, I have this problem. I need a solution right now. Sorry, that's not how he works. But he does bestow favor and honor, just as... Uh, though each of us was the firstborn. And he does what he pleases. He also sanctifies Israel. He will send fire on Magog and those in the coastlands. He sent the whole house of Israel into exile and then brought them back. That's what a uh, nation becoming the nation of Israel becoming a recognized state or a recognized nation. Uh, he brought Israel out of Egypt. That phrase is used all over the place. Uh, he says it constantly. I am the God that brought you out of Israel. He says it over and over and over. He does not want that fact to be forgotten. He wants he wants his children to remember how mighty, how powerful he is. All of the plagues that he put on uh, Egypt and how he rescued his children, the children of Israel, out from those plagues. He will rejoice over Israel with gladness, and he will quiet Israel by his love. He will exult over Israel with loud singing. So the angels aren't going to be the only ones singing in heaven. He himself, our creator, will also be singing. Again, he is the revealer of mysteries. 
and he will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. He will provide an escape from temptation, and he blessed us in Messiah with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. That is a very, very special blessing, and I hope to do a study on that in the future. He only creates that which is good. That, again, is a study in and of itself. Because a lot of people have turned away from God because of things that have gone wrong in their lives. I personally know several uh, that stopped. They didn't stop believing in God, but they stopped putting their faith in God because they saw so much evil in the world. And, uh, and so... When you look at that statement, he only creates that which is good. Go back to Genesis 1 and look at every single day. And there's only one day that that statement is not used. And according to uh, one teacher that uh, comes to mind, it when that word good is used in uh, Genesis 1, it also means complete. So uh, think on that a little bit, and I think you're going to see the, what Yahweh creates uh, does not start if there is something, if a person turns bad, they don't start that way. And so he doesn't create that evil or that uh, that bad part of them. He only creates the good part. And it's through temptation and not having faith that ends up getting people in trouble. And those who abide in love, he abides in them, according to 1 John 4. He's, he also makes covenants, and this is something kind of neat. Those covenants that he makes, or those promises, he keeps those. But he doesn't just keep them, he keeps those that walk before him with all of their heart. So if you think that God's made you a promise and broke it, look at yourself. Have you walked before him with all of your heart? Have you worshipped him with all of your heart and soul? And if the answer comes back, or if you start doing a self-evaluation and saying no, then do you really think that Yahweh broke his promise? Or do you think that he's waiting for you to actually worship him in the way he desires so that he can keep his promise to you? Whatever that promise you think might be. And here, kind of along that line, and sort of opposite of what I was just saying, all at the same time, when he does fulfill his promises, he is not slow to do it. He does not hold out. But at the same time, a lot of times, he, according to what we think is a long time, is actually right away to him. And he does what he says he's going to do. But what doesn't he do? He does not clear the guilty. So if he deems somebody that is guilty of sin or transgression of his laws, he's not going to forgive them. He is not going to lie. And he does not change his mind. And a lot of people think that God can change. Well, 
According to Malachi, uh, chapter 3, he does not change. And a lot of people will say, well, he doesn't change, but his character changes. Well, that's still him changing a part of himself, and that goes against what is written. That goes against his direct words. He does not bribe. And I actually chuckled when I saw this, because how in the world can you bribe the Almighty that owns heaven and earth? And I actually said it out loud, and someone said, well, it's an example of if you do this for me, then God, I will do this for you. And I can see that. Um, But he's always going to just do away with it and not take the bribes and he will not turn away if you return to him uh this is one of those where it's a study in and of itself and getting back to the original language uh but if this a really good example of this is actually in the New Testament and the uh, parable of the prodigal son, where he returned and the father ran out to meet him halfway and then threw him a big party. Uh, He does not despise, he does not hate anyone. He does not withhold good things from those who walk upright. He does not forsake his people, nor does he abandon his heritage. He does not let the righteous go hungry. And if you walk in his ways, if you obey his laws, you will never, ever go hungry. Nor will he let you be tempted beyond your ability. People say that all the time kind of as a passe phrase and uh, right here in 1 Corinthians 10 it states it word for word and so that's the end of this teaching Um, if you have any questions go ahead and post them in the comments or uh, send me an email and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Uh, this is the first out of what I hope to be as very, a lot of teachings. Uh, and so uh, may you be blessed. And may you uh, have, hopefully you learn something from this. And... Uh, Again, if you have any questions, fire away, and I'll try to uh, get back to you as soon as I can. Shalom.